This masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. Hello and welcome to this podcast. I'm Ed Davis. I'm the moderator for this masterclass series for activists on the union movement's history of struggle and achievements. The series draws on the wisdom and experience of Tom MacDonald, former vice president of the ACTU and former national secretary of the Building Workers Industrial Union. Since 1992, a part of the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union. Current and former trade union leaders will join Tom and I during the series. Today, we're very pleased to have two guests with us, Lisa Fitzpatrick, Victorian Secretary of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Union. The Federal Union is Australia's largest union with 280,000 members. And Doug Cameron, former National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union and Federal Senator until he stepped aside last year after 11 years in this role. Welcome Lisa, Doug and Tom. Today's podcast will focus on militancy, leadership and union culture. It has long been Tom McDonald's view that it is militancy that pioneers progressive change. At the same time, Militancy has meant different things to different people. This podcast will unpack militancy and explore its role in delivering gains for workers and their families. It will look at the principles which must underpin militant action if it is to deliver lasting gains. And it will discuss the role that union leadership and union culture play in the practice of militant action. Tom, for years, militant action has been has been attacked by media, has obviously been attacked by governments and attacked by uh, employers. How effective do you think these these employer media government attacks have been in demonising militant action? Sally McManus, when she was asked the question about unions going on strike and breaking the law. And she, with qualifications, defended that right. And what happened is that that sparked a great debate in which our side, including progressive academics, used history to win that argument by saying, if you look at all of the major reforms that have taken place over hundreds of years, it has been through people uniting in action and being positive And when we do that, we can win. So we have to use history to explain the truth about militant action. The AMWU has long been regarded as a militant union. Doug, you were National Secretary for 12 years before going into the federal parliament in 2008. What's your understanding of militancy and uh, what are examples of successful AMWU militant action? Well, thanks, Ed. Look, uh, militancy, in my view, is a determination uh, to get to a goal. It's about being smart. It's about being strategic. And it's about being tough in the pursuit of your objectives. And uh, that's uh, one of the key uh, areas that you have to focus on to get successful outcomes. Okay, so can you give us examples? You think of your years there at the AMWU. Can you give us examples of AMW militant action that you believe really delivered for the union, delivered for all workers? Well, the first uh, job I ever had as a union official was to break the Fraser government wage freeze. And, uh, you know, we went out there, you know, you know arguing uh, shop by shop. Uh, to get wage increases for workers. Uh, We also then moved to the superannuation and uh, the superannuation campaign. And that superannuation campaign is still providing benefits for workers now. If we hadn't have been militant, if we hadn't have been tough, if we hadn't have been strategic in the way that we carried that campaign out, workers would be so much worse off now. Tom. What's your view about what militancy looks like? What are some of the main features of militant action? Well, I agree with Doug and want to make a few extra points. In my opinion, militancy is about action that confronts the employer or the establishment. 
It is taken out of necessity and it seeks to end an injustice or win a progressive objective by imposing a cost on the employer for their failure to end the injustice or agree to the objective. But militancy is not just about taking any form of industrial action. Militancy is about taking action with a just purpose. It's about being smart and strategic as well as tough. It is also about taking action in accordance with values and principles. So, for example, it is not about taking industrial action involving violence or the destruction of property, and it is not about anarchy. Can you give us uh, examples from your union of militant action that really delivered in your experience? I think of, of 1971 when 38,000 building workers went on strike throughout New South Wales. They were demanding full workers' compensation pay when they were only getting half pay when they were off work injured. I remember well into the strike, we had a strike meeting at Wentworth Park and it was decided that at the end of the meeting, we would march up City Road to the headquarters of the Master Builders Association and have a second demonstration. At the head of the march was two rows of workers dressed up as with bandages and in wheelchairs as injured workers. So the focus of the public was on the injured workers. When we arrived at the Master Builders office, there was police everywhere, there was media everywhere, and the doors of the Master Builders building was locked. These workers, some of whom had been out on strike for four weeks, most of them out on strike for four weeks, were angry. So the chant went up, smash the door down and take over the joint. We had prepared our marshals to deal with this situation. And what they did is, don't be silly. We don't want the cameras to focus on broken doors. We want them to focus on the injured workers. The workers responded positively, and we then proceeded to negotiate with the police, send a delegation into the master builders to report on the results of the our stop work meetings. We came out and gave a couple of speeches, and during the speeches, the workers were chanting, United, we will never be defeated. So we got a wonderful media coverage. And a week later, we'd won the struggle. And what happened was, over time, that flowed on to every worker in Australia under state workers' compensation laws, finished up getting full pay when injured. So that shows you that we were able to avoid a disastrous tactic because it would have undermined our public support where the tactic we used ensured that the workers' anger was focused in a way that won public support. Now, Lisa, I, I want to turn to you. you. You represent workers in a very different sort of industry to the uh, industries that Tom and Doug have come from. Now, nurses have been certainly very militant in fighting for living standards uh, and taking action for the care of their patients. Can you tell us a little bit what militancy looks like in your union and uh, and what has militancy achieved? Well, initially, the rules of our union prevented us from taking industrial action. And Barbara Carson, who was the then secretary at the time, was the person who led the charge to say that if we're ever to be taken seriously and if we're ever to actually achieve on behalf of nurses and midwives, we have to be able to take industrial action. And so she was the one who led that removal of that. We uh, had a huge meeting here in Victoria, which I was uh, a young student nurse at, at the My Music Bowl, where nurses voted to actually have those rules, that rule changed and have it removed so that we, we could take action. So then it was about getting nurses to see the, the benefit, making sure that there was a unity across the, the professions around what the things were, the goals that we set, what we wanted to achieve, and making sure that those goals were actually our members' goals, not just the union's goals, but that we we're actually in touch and knew what our members want. So I think to be able to achieve any Anything, you first of all have to make sure that your union is focused 
on your members and is in touch with the members and that you know you have conversations and that you're running training programs for your delegates, for example, so that you're training people about what it is that everybody, you know, what are the things that we're seeking to achieve and you have developed a strategy on how to achieve those things. I think militancy for our members is mostly about protecting the community with quality care, therefore protecting and looking strategically at making sure that we've got nurses and midwives who are going to stay working in the system. I think militancy, you know, it's eventuated in things like walkouts of hospitals for certain periods of time. That's action that nurses took in 2012. The closing of beds has been, again, a very good tool because what it does is it attracts media and community attention. So what Belinda Morrison, when she was the secretary of the ANMF, taught all of us as nurses and midwives across the state uh, from 2000 onwards was that we place signs on beds, including in emergency departments. We also, for theatre sessions, where we said that that bed could not be admitted to. So in essence, we've had during our enterprise agreement campaigns, uh, which has been the predominant time when we have had to be militant, is hospitals didn't admit patients uh, into those beds and that attracted great media attention. So sometimes we put a sign on the bed saying it was closed. Uh, sometimes nurses would put the mattress under the bed. Sometimes they'd hide a mattress in a linen cupboard. But in essence, really great ideas and, and great passion and, and great buy-in from members, which is why it's successful and has been successful. And then, of course, the media attention happens. And then, of course, we've been able to keep tallies, of course, from our activists and our job representatives in the workplaces so that we know each day how many beds have been closed and we would report that to the media. And it's not really good enough for a government to say, well, no, there's not 900 beds closed. The nurses' union is wrong. There's only 733 closed because the media and the community want the issue fixed. So I think very much agreeing with what Doug said around being strategic. So one of the uh, things that obviously happened in your union was a discussion of the, the forms of industrial action that would have most impact that were that were building the power that you had very much so and i think all of our strategies also have involved work with the community uh, so in our big dispute in 2011-12 under the bailiw state government here in victoria where nurses again uh, at the end ended up breaking the law and took unprotected industrial action had two, three-hour walkouts at targeted hospitals. But before that, we'd had something like uh, 33 community rallies around metropolitan and regional Victoria. But the cause for nurses and midwives has always been one of not just about, yes, they want to be rewarded, but it hasn't been so much about salaries. It's actually been about themselves as far as being able to provide a service to the community. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thank you for that. Doug, I'd, I'd like to come back to you. We touched on this a, a little bit earlier, but I, I want to come to this issue of the way that principles and, and values guide industrial action. Again, thinking about the AMWU, can you give examples of that? Can you take us a bit deeper into this exploration of the role of values, principles, and shaping militant action? Yeah, Ed, we always had a view that the principle that should underpin any action was that it had the full support of rank and file members. And we always went to mass meetings across the country. It got acceptance from the members to take a course of action, explain the action. I uh, heard from the members, included their views in the actions that we took going forward. So inclusion, consultation is one of the key principles that the AMWU uh, always went to in major industrial action. We would not have achieved shorter hours if we hadn't you know, consulted widely. We hadn't brought the membership with us if we hadn't, uh, you know, got the ideas from the members. So that consultation was important. But we also had an education campaign and an education facility within the union that, that could go to our shop stewards, educate them on the reasons why we uh, were pursuing this. And we had this philosophy of educate, 
organize and control. And uh, we use that education forum to actually get the message out, get the, the leadership in the workshop committed, and they could then pass that on to the membership. So we had this cohesive approach to organizing and campaigning, and it was based on education. Tom, your union has had a long history of taking militant action to to bring about change. What's at the heart of militant action? Militancy is about taking action designed to force your opponent into a constructive negotiation that end in an agreement. And that's the purpose of it. So how did your union approach negotiations when in dispute with an employer? We never allowed a dispute to be seen as a dispute between the union and the employer. We always stressed that it was a dispute between the employees of the employer and not a dispute between the union and the employer so that uh, the employer understood that they had to recognise and accept the will of the membership expressed through democratic meetings of the membership. So our, our simple approach was to convince the employer that they can only resolve the dispute if they recognised that they had to negotiate to create an outcome that the membership would accept. Those sort of arguments were used. So you avoided that was the union against the employer because the employer would think uh, that if he can get rid of the union or if he can undermine the union, his problem was solved. But if you recognised that the problem was between the employer and the uh, and the workers, and then you created the best atmosphere for a negotiated settlement. And the role of leaders is to find solutions in way that you, you wisely use the power of so the workers. How do you maximise workers' power to to win, and what were the principles and values that guided you? Power of workers is maximised, in my view, when they are united at the workplace, when decisions are made democratically, when solidarity is built across the union movement, and your tactics isolate your opponent. When you uh, have democratic decisions, you are educating the workers in the debates that uh, takes place when you're dealing with a difficult, important struggle. It's important to build up the class consciousness and political consciousness of the membership by involving them in, in the democratic process about the decisions you need to make and the tactics you need to use. The union's real power in a, in a major struggle was the membership being in support of the campaign and the activists giving leadership to the membership at the, the workplace level and the leadership giving leadership to the activists at the activist level. It was like a good football team is not a good team if it's based on individuals, but it's a good team when everyone in the team works together, understands the strategy and tactics of the union, and they implement their role, conscious that they were an important part of whether you would win or lose. Power is not an endless thing. There's limits to the extent that workers can struggle. You have to operate within those limits and you have to prioritise the issues that the membership were prepared to take decisive action that involved them making big sacrifices. I always believed that if you abuse your power, misdirected your power, you could destroy your power. Tom, picking up that point about not abusing or misdirecting power, were there any types of direct action that, that you considered unacceptable? Industrial action is not militant action if it involves undisciplined and unacceptable behaviour and if it puts short-term considerations 
ahead of the long-term interest of the working class or brings the trade union movement into disrepute because that is doomed to lead the workers to defeat. So a good militant tactic is one that advances you towards your objective and a bad tactic is one that you can't defend in the eyes of the community. So, Tom, to, to what extent did you feel your union needed to have community support for the action uh, that your union took? My personal approach was that any action of the union did not need to be supported by the general public, but it was important that they respect uh, the actions of the union uh, as being reasonable or necessary, and there was some justification for it. So you had to convince the general public that what you were struggling for was for a noble objective. Doug, when you think about the the safety net, the the importance of, of that array of conditions that apply to people at work to do with hours, leave, safety, and so on, do you think there's a, a good understanding that it was union and union militant action that played such an important role in in winning those achievements? Well, I think some workers take it for granted. They don't understand the historic struggles of unions to improve wages and conditions. I think many young workers now see that, uh, you know, this stuff can be achieved through individual action. And this goes back to the very principle of collectivism versus individualism. If you are in a strong bargaining position as an individual, you'll always be in an even stronger position if you've got a collective behind you. And I think the coalition and employers understand this well. That's why we had the attack on work choices. That's why we've had a narrowing of what you can bargain for in the Australian industrial system. This is why, you know, work choices was so toxic to the trade union movement and why we had to stand up and fight against it. I just think the politics of where we are at the moment makes it extremely difficult for unions to bargain effectively. When we first started enterprise bargaining with a a very strong effect of trade union movement, it worked well. But given the political changes that have taken place, the legislative changes, the attacks on unions through legislation, it's even more difficult. And I think Labour and the union movement need to have a close look at this going into the next election because we need a position where workers can act collectively. We would never have achieved shorter hours. We would never have achieved superannuation unless workers were able to act collectively across an industry. Now, I supported enterprise bargaining when it came in, but I think it's uh, it's now becoming a major impediment. Uh, when I first became a union official in Sydney, I would go to Redfern Oval, I'd go to Leichhardt Oval. There would be 15, 20,000 workers coming to those two ovals to discuss the issues that were important for working people. Now with enterprise bargaining, people are compartmentalized and uh, they just don't. They're always looking at their toes. They're never looking up and around under the bargaining system at the moment. And I just think we need to to get back to a position where there is a freeing up of the issues that workers can bargain for. There is a move back to some pattern bargaining across industry because that's what's going to make, you know, workers understand that it's not about the individual, not about an individual workshop. It's about a collective. And all of the issues we, you know, managed to win, the big issues that are now basics in the, the manufacturing industry, were done through collective action across workplaces, not within individual workplaces. Right of entry has been restrictive, pattern bargaining has been restricted. It makes it really difficult. But, you know, unions have faced this before, and that's why we've got excellent leaders like Sally and, and, uh, you know, mentors like Tom out there talk to people about this because we need to actually put pressure on the Labour Party to free up the bargaining capacity of workers. Otherwise, it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to make major changes like we did in the past that have become safety net principles. I'm just going to ask each of you to think about when 
perhaps you were a young activist uh, in your union. Was there a piece of advice that, that you got from some mentor or union elder that influenced you in the way that, uh, that you went about your business? Tom, could we start with you? Yes. Um, when I was in my uh, early 20s, actually more like 18, I went up to the home of the communist secretary of the of the Glee branch of the Communist Party, and in the wall of his lounge room was a plaque, and it had a message about the role of life. So I decided that was for me. Now, I have it in copy here, so I'll read it out. It said, Man's dearest possession is life, and since it is given to us to live just once, it must not be smeared with the shame of a cowardly and trivial past. We must not live through years without purpose. We must live so that in dying, we can say that all our lives and all our strength was given to the greatest cause in the world, the liberation of all humanity. So I always think of that because that's the big picture of what life is all about. Lisa. I think I took a lot of ideas and I was very strongly influenced by my predecessor, Belinda Morrison. She guided me in so far as to say it's always members, members, members first. And I think the other thing that she also taught me is to be strategic and that sometimes you could get more with honey than vinegar. Don't. Well, I was very fortunate to have lots of terrific unionists. Uh, when I first came in, polite Tom, people like Laurie Carmichael, John Halfpenny, and my mentor, a guy called Bob Adamson, an Irish boil maker from Newcastle. What they all had in common was the need to understand your op opponent, the need to continue to educate yourself. And I remember Laurie Carmichael handing me a list of books that I had to go and read when I became a union official. So education of the, a union official was extremely important in the time I became a union official. And, uh, you know, fantastic unionists like Laurie Carmichael, John Halfpenny, Paul Adamson were there to assist, mentor, and actually point you in the right direction. And I've got to place on record that Tom has done that in spades for the trade union movement. He has been fantastic and this will pay a lot of dividends in the future. Young activists look to experienced people to get their principles, their values and their culture developed. And if you've got uh, that uh, approach, then education, principled action, no arrogance, no violence, as I've said earlier, mindful militancy is the way forward. Let's imagine that you're sitting down and you've got a, a young activist with you. What would be a straightforward, a, a, a simple message that you would want to give, a piece of advice you'd want to give to an activist starting out in the union movement? Doug, we'll begin with you and then flow across. Doug. Never to take anything on face value, to critically analyse what the boss is telling you. Critically analyse what the coalition are saying, what the Labour Party are saying. Always have a view that's in the interests of the collective and critically analyse it from that perspective. Thanks for that. Lisa? I would say about learn about your union and what it's achieved if you want to be an activist in that union and then work out what are the things that are still missing, that are still important, that are important to members, and then to stay engaged, to put yourself out there, to get involved in the programs that the union has in relation to coming in and working, the Anna Stewart Memorial Program, you know, the opportunities that are out there, but very much encouraging. I think it's much better for people if they can come in and see us. And I think the union programs like the Union Summer Program, Anna Stewart, we've got different programs ourselves where our activists actually come in and see what we do and how we do it and then and bring in their ideas is, is a really important thing for activists to be able to do. Get involved in your union. Get engaged. So well, I would say to an activist, always think positive. See problems as challenges to be overcome. Never be a pessimist because they find reasons to justify doing nothing. 
When you look at history, positive thinking leads to hope, hope leads to struggle, and struggle leads to success. Thanks, Lisa, Doug, and Tom, for a great discussion. The theme has been the central importance of militant action in delivering gains for all workers and their families. All three speakers have underlined that militancy must be shaped by union principles and values. It must be smart, strategic, tough, and for a just cause. This is mindful militancy, or militancy with a purpose, as former ACTU Secretary Bill Kelty has put it. History demonstrates that it's militancy based on well-considered strategy and tactics that has built workers' power and delivered lasting gains. And now a song to close by Chloe and Jason Roweth. They're drawing from their extensive repertoire of traditional and contemporary songs to bring you a powerful example of music used in support of progressive change. Over to you. Thanks, Ed. We're going to sing a song called Norman Brown, written by Dorothy Hewitt and set to a traditional tune, which we source from the Builders Labourers Songbook. Dorothy's song refers to the events of December 16, 1929 at Rothbury in New South Wales where miners were protesting uh, the reopening of the mine using scab labour. Police attacked the crowd of miners with batons and shots were fired. Some miners were wounded and Norman Brown died and Norman became a martyr to the cause. The New South Wales Northern District President of the Union said... The mounted police came through and were merciless in their attacks. My recollection is that there were several bursts of firing and each time the men would retreat and when there was a lull, move back to the fence. And the whole affair must have gone on for about four hours. Now, we played this song for years with Norman in our hearts and heads as a, a martyr, an icon. And then we were playing a gig in Canberra and we sang the song and I could see a sort of a commotion around a particular woman in the crowd. And after the gig, she came up and introduced herself as Norman Brown's niece. And we were immediately made aware of a, a more human aspect to the tragedy that occurred that day. And it made us think of Norman in a different way every time we've sung it since. Norman Brown was about 65 yards from the fence when the bullet struck him. He had been sitting down talking to a girlfriend and was just getting up when he was hit.
The murdering cop is they shot him down. They shot him down in Rothbury Town to live forever. No. This Masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. The support of the Committee to Defend Trade Union Rights and of Tony and Nina Bleasdale is gratefully acknowledged. I hope you'll join us on the next episode of this Masterclass series for Empowering Activists. I'm Ed Davis. Bye for now.